Next, our speaker is keynote speaker, Dr. Dr. Sri Ram Krishna Swami. He's our keynote speaker of today, and he's going to join us virtually. Dr. Krish is a professor in the Department of Pediatrics and Biochemistry and Biophysics at the University of Pennsylvania. He is also a Stokes investigator at the Children's Hospital at Philadelphia Research Institute. His laboratory uses biochemistry, biophysics, and the structural biology to establish how the proteins of blood coagulation interact to regulate enzyme function and clot formation. Today, Dr. Krish is sorry is going to sorry. talk about the protolysis and the birth factor. The structure and function. Please take it away. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm deeply honored um, to be selected as one of the Earl Davy speakers at this symposium. Um, but at the same time, you know, I'm really disappointed that I couldn't come to Vancouver uh, and uh, be at the, uh, the symposium in person and also hang out with my very good friends who are at UBC as well. Um, but anyway, so today I'm going to talk about uh, some structure function studies we're doing with Factor 5 and 5A. Uh, and to set the stage, and I feel silly about talking about this at an Earl Davy symposium, but just let me remind you so I can set the stage for uh, what, what, why what we're studying is important, right? And so you all probably know, I and mean, if you don't, now you will, that coagulation is an inert system in blood and is activated on demand by, let's say, vascular damage that exposes tissue factor. And what this does is trigger a series of very discrete proteolytic activation events, in each case converting an inactive precursor to an active protease, a zymogen to a protease. And all of this converges or culminates in the formation of thrombin. Now, this cascade arrangement, uh, you might also well know, or was pointed out earlier, uh, that was initially proposed by Earl Davy and Oscar Ratnoff in 1965 or 4, I can't remember. But nevertheless, you know, some of the details have changed, but the basic picture has. So thrombin is the key product of clotting because it can clot convert fibrinogen to fibrin and activate platelets to essential components in the clot. But thrombin is now also a key regulatory agent because early in its production, it can rapidly feed back and activate two cofactors, five and eight in this case, and five over here, which are essential elements of the enzyme complexes in each of these cases. And I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, this greatly accelerates the reaction rate and greatly accelerates flux towards thrombin formation. And, of course, later on in the process, thrombin binds thrombomodulin, catalyzes APC formation, and APC inactivates the same cofactors that were initially activated by thrombin, and thereby decreases flux to this the formation of thrombin. So what you see is these cofactors here play essential roles in regulating clotting. And the one I'm going to be talking about today is associated with this enzyme complex that converts both from to from the um, Sorry. And so the enzyme complex here is composed of factor 10A bound to a cofactor 5A on membranes containing phosphatidyl serine. And the binding interaction of the cofactor with the protease greatly increases catalytic function. Right? But just like factor 10A circulates as a precursor, inactive precursor, factor 5A also circulates as a inactive pro-cofactor. This is a large polypeptide chain with a dispensable central B domain that's about half the length of the molecule. And this B domain is proteolized and released Factor 5 can't bind 10A, it's then converted to a 10A binding protein and therefore becomes a cofactor. So what's the problem with factor 5 activation? What's the basic biochemistry of the problem? So here is a schematic diagram of <clears throat> factor 5. In green are the domains that make the business end of cofactor molecule. 
In the middle is this very large central B domain with three landmarks, all right? Two acidic regions that flank the B domain and a central basic region. And when you proteolize all of this, you get this heterodimeric factor 5a, where one acidic region is remains, and I'm focusing on this for a specific reason, and this basic region and acidic region 2 are gone. So when you can proteolize factor 5, if factor 5 can't bind 10a, you make factor 5a this heterodimer, and it binds 10 So early on, my colleague Rodney Kamir over here was trying to express recombinant factor 5, and he did a trick that worked very well for factor 8, and that is he truncated most of the B domain because of time, and perhaps even now, people think it doesn't mean anything. All right, so he made this truncated species, and unbeknownst to him, he had lost, at the time, he had lost this centrally located basic region. And so he has this single chain polypeptide that contains these two acidic regions, shortened B domain, expresses very well, but it was shocking to find that it was a constitutively active cofactor, didn't require proteolysis like the parent molecule before it could bind 10A and function as a cofactor in prothrombin activation. I will remind you, uh, just uh, give Alan Mast a, a boost over here, point out that he's going to be talking about a naturally occurring variant factor five short, or several of the related molecules that closely resemble this factor five DT, this truncated form. Well, it didn't stop there, the amazement, because what you could do is take this isolated basic region, say produced in bacteria, add it back to the species, and it bound with really high affinity in a calcium dependent way, and that's also important, uh, to revert this cofactor, this constitutively active cofactor to a pro-cofactor, one that couldn't function in binding 10A or working as a cofactor, and then required proteolysis to be active. Okay, so that's basically the set of observations that has set us along this path. So what was the idea? The idea we had or proposed based on a variety of structures and also now more recently a cryo-EM structure of uh, 5A bound to 10A. The idea was that these regions, these landmarks, acidic region 1, basic region, acidic region 2, widely separated in space, could come together to form this tripartite motif that also occluded other 10A binding sites. And uh, therefore, the proco factor was inactive. You have proteolysis, you release this acidic region 2 containing polypeptide and this basic region po containing polypeptide, basically open up uh, two important regions for 10A binding and then allow the expression of cofactor activity. All right, so that was the, the, the that was the hypothesis, and again, uh, this is now supported by a variety of structural elements. But at the, t uh, but the question still remains: How can these distant amino uh, uh, regions, separated by several hundred amino acids, all come together in three-dimensional space like it's proposed? And uh, so we went ahead and uh, crystallized factor five DT again. This is now the truncated form that's constitutively active doesn't have the basic region, contains a shortened sorry, uh, a shortened B domain right here, containing the two acidic regions. And here's the structure. And this follow you can follow it along with the schematic, N-terminal A1, A2, short B domain that contains the two acidic regions, A3, C1, C2, and C terminals. These arrows point out two bound calciums, and it turns out that this one is important. Well, in the structure, we couldn't resolve much of the B domain, and that's because it's spaghetti, it's disordered. Yeah? And so uh, what's new? And what's new is the fact that, oops, sorry, let me just show you what it looks like when you rotate it around. It has this very peculiar shape. It looks like a fish. It two long axes, one short depth. Yeah? All right. Uh, what we could do was trace parts of the acidic region 1 and 2, even though we couldn't trace the rest of the B domain. And you see that they form this structure right over here, this extended structure that's also right next to the salmon residues on the A2 domain that have also been in implicated in 10A binding. This structure is stabilized by calcium. Okay, so the hypothesis was that this provides a plausible uh, uh, idea that you have an extended surface from acidic region 1 and 2 
even though they're really far apart in the polypeptide sequence, that they come together immediately adjacent to other important regions for TNA binding to provide a surface to which the basic peptide may bind, occlude important TNA binding sites, and keep make this molecule a prococfactor. And this is consistent with, consistent with the fact that this structure is stabilized by this bound calcium and potentially explains why the basic peptide binding is calcium dependent. Okay, that was a proposal, but what about experimental evidence for this? And we sought to use hydrogen deuterium exchange to see if we could obtain direct evidence for binding of the basic region to that specified putative uh, ex extended surface. Yeah? And so I'm sure you've all heard of this in many, t many times, but I'll just briefly walk you through this. Uh, so, it, it normally, uh, side chains and the amide protons in a polypeptide chain are protonated. They contain dissociable protons. The, for the purposes of this experiment, of course, uh, binding and dissociation of protons to the side chains is basically instantaneous. In contrast, uh, binding and exchange of the amide protons is slow. So, what you can do is you take a protein, drop it into D2O solvent, the amide uh, backbone protons exchange in a way that's dependent on the dynamic or the structured nature of the polypeptide. Dynamic regions exchange quickly, structured regions exchange slowly, so you allow this to go for varying amounts of time. Quench the reaction by dropping the pH and lowering the temperature to lock in the deuterons that have exchanged. Digest this with a nonspecific protease to make a whole bunch of overlapping peptides analyzed by LCMS to look to try to infer proton uptake on a poor residue or deuteron uptake on a poor residue basis. And this was done in collaboration with Ren Hao Li at Emory University, shown here is the coverage map on this factor 5 DT molecule. You have overlapping pepti <coughs> peptides uh, with an average of 4.2 peptides per residue. And this is really good because what it allows us to do is eliminate nearest neighbor effects of the adjacent amino acids. Uh, and then because we've done it at various times, we can construct progress curves and extract exchange rates, blue in this diagram being slow, red being fast, and we can map it onto the factor five DT structure. And you can see that some areas are structured, some areas are not, etc. So this in itself uh, doesn't tell us much what we want to know is what happens when you add the basic region. Do we get evidence for it binding in this region, as we originally thought? And the answer is yes. Okay, shown here are in blue uh, the regions that didn't change at all, very little anyway, when you add the basic region. Shown here as an example, 604 to 614. We're looking at deuterium incorporation as a function of time. I remind you that time is logarithmic here. With and without and with base, uh, the presence of the basic region, you basically get the same progress curve for deuterium uptake. In contrast, in these red areas that we found to be changed, uh, 629 to 634, for example, again, deuterium uptake, function of log logarithmic time. When you add the basic peptide, you slow down deuterium uptake by, let's say, 40-fold. So what we have are really three independent lines of evidence. Uh, I've talked about two. I'll briefly mention the, second, uh, the third. So we have this X-ray structure that uh, uh, illustrates that this acidic region one and two that can come together and potentially form a, it's a plausible, plausibly form an extended surface to which the basic region can bind and thereby occlude all the sites that are important for TNA binding. We also did computational studies, which I didn't talk about because, you know, really science fiction. But nevertheless, here is a model basic region docked onto, uh, computationally docked onto the structure that we have from the X-ray crystallography. And uh, the most prevalent solution was one that looked like this, where the basic region snugly binds in this area uh, stabilized by a calcium. And then, of course, we have these HDX studies that uncannily <laughs> illuminate basically the same areas that we proposed from the x-ray structures where as an area that is perturbed when the basic peptide binds. So, okay, so we have experimental evidence for this kind of initial hypothesis. Procofactor is inactive because of this inhibitory motif 
proteolysis releases these peptides and opens up a tinny binding site. But of course, there are three cleavages. The activation process is complicated. How does the formation of cofactor relate to cleavages in the B domain uh, and regulate function? Right? And so this has been studied a lot, all right? People have studied this stuff since, you know, 1980s. And basically what you do is you add, let's say, thrombin to start the cleavage reactions going, run SDS gels to look at various polypeptides formed, measure cofactor activity, and, uh, and thereby infer which species are active or not. And both approaches have fundamental problems. So we'll start with the running gels part. So this is a typical experiment done by many, many other people. The representation of factor five is a little different to, to accommodate the space here. So you have factor five, this full length species with a full length B domain. Uh, you add thrombin and with time you see factor five goes away. A bunch of these bands come up and go away and then presumably the terminal products come up. This is the N-terminal derived heavy chain and this is the C-terminal derived light chain which form a heterodimer and have cofactor function. Well, you might already look at this and know there's a problem. First is all these species stain differentially when you stain pro or protein, whether it's Kumasi blue or whatever it is. That's one problem. The second problem is it's very difficult to unambiguously identify species that are coming up and going away. All right. Uh, and the third problem, which is actually illustrated at the bottom over here, is that if you look at the starting material, you already have partially cleaved forms. This is an inherent problem with factor five. There's nothing you can do about it. And these are variable depending on the prep that you start. But this is a particularly good one. So how do we get around this? Well, Hal Bradford in my lab took several months out of his life. He developed this quantitative blotting approach using in infrared fluorescence. Uh, and so what he did was took an antibody with an epitope in the A2 domain, he tagged it with the infrared 700 dye, took an antibody with an epitope in the A3 domain, tagged it with an 800 dye, and of course these antibodies blot, so they blot well. So if you have a single polypeptide after you run SDS gel and do a western blot, where both epitopes are present, it shows up as a yellow colored band. In contrast, when you get cleavage, all the polypeptide species that contain this A2 epitope uh, from the heavy chain show up as red. So, and if you have, uh, and all the uh, polypeptide chains containing this A3 epitope show up in green. So it's like reading an SDS gel, okay? I mean, a, a DNA gel. You just look at the molecular weight and look at the color and you know what it is, all right? So after all this work, he was able to make some pretty looking gels. So here's one example. So factor five is yellow because both epitopes are one polypeptide and it goes away with time. You have those red bands corresponding to the epitope containing the N-terminal derived heavy chain. And you see that you get heavy chain formation quite quickly. And in green, you see all the polypeptides containing the A3 epitope. And you see that the light chain surprisingly comes up really slowly and that actually even at 10 minutes is mostly tied up as high molecular weight species, right? So the conclusion is heavy chain formation is very rapid, light chain formation is slow and looks incomplete. Now uh, we were concerned that somehow we were getting faked out by the conditions we picked. And so we varied enzyme, we varied substrate, we varied time. And what you can see is two examples shown here, the picture is the same. Factor five goes away, the heavy chain comes up right away, the light chain comes up very really slow. So from this, we conclude that these two cleavages that give the mature heavy chain are fast. This cleavage here that give the mature light chain is very slow, and this is just C-terminus to this acidic region too. Well, while we were working on this, of course, we had to deal with another problem. And so let me just quickly walk you through this. So when you activate prothrombin, the zymogen to thrombin, you release this N-terminal propiece uh, that allows prothrombin to bind to membranes and thrombin does not. But because there are two cleavages, it turns out there's an intermediate that's produced called miezothrombin. This now contains a fully functional protease domain, but is covalently attached to the propiece. 
So the idea in the old days was mesothrombin can bind membranes just like factor V, and mesothrombin is likely a very efficient activator of factor V, and some people even claimed it was better than thrombin. Well, we had a little bit of difficulty with this because in a completely different line of investigation, what we found was that mesothrombin, even though it's activated protease, is actually very zymogen-like and it's related to this covalent linkage with the propeptide. The question was, how can mesothrombin, which is zymogen-like, be a better activator or a good activator of factor V? And so we tested this. So now we have mesothrombin, combined membranes, mesothrombin that has the propease covalently attached. We had phospholipids, look at factor V cleavage. And here you see with thrombin, you get heavy chain quickly, light chain comes up slowly, some high molecular weight species. But in the case of mesothrombin, heavy chain formation is affected slightly. But what it is, is that you don't get any light chain. So what it says is that despite the ability of this species to bind membranes, it cleaves factor V a lot more slowly than thrombin, unlike what everybody has been imagining. Whoops, and this simply just illustrates that point. Again, thrombin, heavy chain, light chain, light chain comes up more slowly. In the case of mesothrombin, again, heavy chain formation is affected slightly, but the light chain is really slow. It's about 10 to 15 fold slower than what you see from it. So, so what, right? You're just looking at the terminal products of the, of the activation reaction. The intermediates could have activity. So how do you relate all of these uh, cleavage, cleavage steps to function? And so normally what people do is simply just take these variously quenched time points, add 10A, add prothrombin, and look at thrombin formation. But there's a real problem with that because you generate a ton of protease in very short time, and this could fundamentally change the distribution between cleave species, and it does. So what we chose to do is then uh, pass our ideas in this following way. So you can't get a cofactor unless you have a species that can bind 10. So if you can measure binding of 10A in the absence of proteolysis, you should be able to correlate cleavage with cofactor function. And so what we used was an inactivated form of 10A with a fluorescent chloroketone tether at the active site. And this fluorophore reports the binding of 10A to 5. And then we asked, okay, what does it look like? So again, now we have mesothrombin, we have thrombin, I, I'm sorry, thrombin, we have mesothrombin. Uh, we get heavy chain formation, light chain formation. In the case of mesothrombin, light chain is formed very slowly. And in black is the anisotropy measurement associated with the ability of 10A to bind a species, a cofactor-like species. And you see that this closely correlates, surprisingly, with the formation of the heavy chain and not with the, uh, I mean, not the light chain and not the heavy chain or other intermediates. So what this tells us is light chain formation is slow, but it's also the rate limiting step in the proteolytic conversion of factor five to a species that can bind 10A with high affinity on membranes and assemble to form prothrombinase. So let me put this in perspective in the context of thrombin structures and the function uh, that's understood. So here's the catalytic domain of thrombin in the standard view. It has two prominent anion binding exercises. Exercise one plays a fundamental role in the ability of thrombin to act on a wide variety of substrates. That includes fibrinogen, platelet activated, uh, protease activated receptors, and so on and so forth. And on binding exercise two, that's clear on the other side of the molecule, has not been implicated previously in substrate recognition, uh, but in fact is actually the site where the propiece that's covalently attached in mesothrombin sits. Okay, so in mesothrombin, this site is covalently occluded. So what we find is that. The heavy chain formation, these rapid, two rapid reactions in the activation of, 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 of factor five, are minorly affected by, by whether you have mesothrombin or thrombin. What that means is that exercise two doesn't play a prominent role, but from other evidence, we know that exercise one is really important for this. In contrast, this rate limiting step in cofactor formation, which is slow, is cleaved a lot more slowly in mesothrombin than in thrombin because the site is occluded, 
meaning it's highly dependent on exercise two and from data that I haven't shown you, doesn't require exercise one. So what we can do is expand our ideas just a little bit. The original idea I've talked about many times, we have an inhibitory tripartite motif that's opened up by proteolysis. If you get cleavage at any of the uh, two of the three sites, but don't create the light chain, so acidic region two is still intact, this inhibitory structure presumably still persists because tene can't bind. And from data I haven't shown you, we also know that if you only cut after acidic region two to make the light chain, but the polypeptide here, B domain, still contains all three landmarks covalently on one structure, you still unravel the inhibitory motif to open up 10 a binding sites. So to sum up, our structural studies provide a plausible explanation why FACT5 can't uh, bind 10 a and how proteolysis uh, may convert this, uh, remove this inhibitory restriction uh, for these three distant regions coming together and uh, allow the cofactor to bind 10A, whereas the pro cofactor doesn't. And from the functional studies, the biochemical studies, what we show is that cleavage of acidic region 2 is sufficient to disrupt this inhibitory motif, whereas the other cleavages are not to expose 10A binding sites and lead to cofactor function. And just to finish up, these are the guys in my lab who did the work I talked about. I mentioned, mentioned Hal Bradford. Shaker did the X-ray crystallography work. Our longstanding collaborator, Rodney Kamir at Penn. And the HDX was done by Ren Hao Li and, of course, the uh, synchrotron source. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank very, you much, very much, Dr. Krish. Now we have time for questions. Hey, Chris, this is Alan. Can you hear me? Sure. I have a couple questions. When, for your deuterium exchange experiments, did you ever try that with factor five um, Leiden to see if the B domain or, or the basic region was more or less effective than uh, a blocking exchange in factor five Leiden versus regular? No, no, we didn't. But uh, just to just since you asked, let me just finish by saying that we also did the HDX on the basic region, right? So the data I showed you was the HDX on factor five DT or factor five short, whichever it is. Uh, we also did uh, the the HDX on the basic region, and so we have a good idea of which areas probably are perturbed or ordered when the basic region binds this acidic interface, whatever it is. And is that, is that affected by fact? Or no, I don't know. I, I have no idea. Okay. The other question is, and this could mean me just being confused, will, according to the data you presented for how the B domains complete cleaved and when it binds 10A, does factor five short bind to factor 10A to assemble prothrombinase? Yeah, factor five short is effectively no different than factor five DT. Okay, great, thank you. I enjoyed your talk. Yeah, thank you. Come on, Conway, ask me a question. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. It looks like we have a question on a slide. Oh, okay. Beautiful talk, Dr. Trickers. My friend, how would you, how would polyphosphate or heparin affect the acidic basic domain mediated regulation of FV activation? But you have to tell me who asked the question. Dr. Chris. Ah, Ed. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know, Ed. Uh, you know, the basic region, you would expect it to bind heparin. You would expect it to bind uh, polyphosphate. And I think Rodney has some indication of something different, and that is 
that uh, protamin can uh, substitute for the basic region, at least in the case of factor V short and this factor V DT species. Um, you might expect that heparin would have an effect, but you know, the problem really is that the binding of the basic region is really strong. And um, it, it, heparin binding, obviously, you would have to go to really high concentrations where there are other issues that come up to look to see if heparin could interfere with that process. Thank you. Any more questions? All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Krish. Appreciate Thank that. Thank you. Hopefully, we can have you in the near future at TBR visiting us. Thank you.